The scripture this morning that we're going to read is from Psalm 32 and Psalm 38. And uh, you may be able to uh, discern some common threads here. Uh, Psalm 32, I'm going to read the first five verses. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So let's uh, turn over to Psalm 38 and read the first eight verses of that psalm. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Uplifting verses, to be sure. Right? You may be seated. But we're going to go back to uh, the Psalms in just a few minutes. But... Um, I was, I was sitting here and I always observe, uh, I observe every church has its own particular ceremony, how it takes the offering, how it greets people, uh, when it sings what, uh, when it reads the scripture and so on. And so I try to observe that and, and get that uh, in, my, in my mind a little bit. And that's because uh, I don't know you from Adam or Eve and you don't know me uh, from Adam either. And uh, I will tell you that I have never been a preacher that has really good comic timing, so I can't tell a joke. I can read a story. I can think of something extemporaneously. Um, but uh, I was sitting here racking my mind, and I could only think of three jokes. So when I tell you this one, you will have heard one-third of my repertoire this morning. All right. There was a very stately woman who came in the back door of the church. Now stop me if Al Fletcher told this last Sunday. Okay. Raise your hand if he did. A uh, very stately woman, very well appointed, well dressed, came in the back door of the auditorium. The usher, being very dutiful, went up to her and asked where he might seat her. She said, right down front. He said, Really, you, you don't want to be seated right down front. Our pastor is, is not the most interesting. And she said, I want to be seated right down front. He said, really, really, our, our, our pastor is kind of boring, actually. And she said, young man, right down front. And he said, but he preaches so long. She said, right down front. So he said, all right, uh, I, I will give you what you want. Uh, there, there's a nice seat there in the second row. And he took her down the aisle. She took him by the arm. He walked her down the aisle, and she sat right down front in the second row. And then she looked at him and said, young man, do you know who I am? He said, no. She said, I am the pastor's mother. And he looked at her and said, do you know who I am? 
she said, no. And he said, good. <laughs> and that's it. We don't know each other. We don't know each other today. But I'm hoping um, through the grace of God and by the grace of God that this has been uh, a moment that God has brought about. And I am very happy to get to know you over the days ahead. And a transitional pastor is, uh, is often uh, simply a little bit longer of an interim, gives the church uh, a chance to kind of uh, retool itself and refocus and reconfigure after a long pastorate. And uh, he helps them uh, hopefully get through to the next phase where they're ready for the next long-term pastor or uh, whatever their future is going to hold. It's a little intimidating uh, to have it announced ahead of you that you're going to take the church from here to this wonderful place down in the future. Uh, no pressure there, Flo, thank you very much. But uh, anyway, I'm here. My name is Jim Grumbine. I'm a Pennsylvanian by birth. I have lived in Maine. I had, a, I had the uh, North Deering Alliance Church in the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination for eight years, uh, Washington Avenue in Portland. And um, my son, my middle son, graduated from Gordon College. Uh, my daughter graduated from uh, USM. And uh, so our family is very much oriented to this area. And uh, we very much enjoy this area. So we decided that we were going to move back this way as our uh, retirement neared. And as you can see, I'm no spring chicken. So uh, our retirement is nearing. And that's why we're here. Uh, I preached my last Sunday two weeks ago uh, in, uh, in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, which is right across the river from uh, Harrisburg, the state capital. Camp Hill's an interesting place. There's a Friendly's ice cream store, and next to it on the sidewalk is a plaque that indicates that uh, Robert E. Lee had sent some Confederate soldiers to uh, scope out the high ground across the river from the state capitol so that he could set up artillery batteries to bombard Harrisburg. But they were routed by Union troops, and it never took place. And uh, so that's the significance of Camp Hill. Um, so my roots are in the Christian and Missionary Alliance, but I promise very hard to try to be a good Baptist uh, for a while now. Uh, how many have heard of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, where my roots are? Okay, a good number of you. Uh, we don't have a lot of really famous people, probably the most famous person from the Christian and Missionary Alliance is A.W. Tozer. He was a CMA. And a modern day evangelist, uh, Ravi Zacharias, anybody, he's, he's CMA also. Uh, so those are a, a few of our uh, folks. But the gospel is the same, whether it's Baptist or Alliance or EFRI or whatever else. And uh, we are part of the family of God. So I want to ask you a question, and uh, you don't have to answer this out loud. In fact, it's probably preferable if you don't. What have you done uh, at a former time in your life that has left guilt behind? What about the life that you are living right now? Are you carrying a heavy load of guilt? For whatever reason. Now, guilt can be very insidious. It can affect us uh, as we go through our day and as we live our life. And it can affect us and burden us. And it can always, it can feel like just little teeth biting at us or some little pain that just nags and nags. And you don't even really think about it, but it just makes you miserable. And guilt can do that. Or guilt can be some heavy thing that debilitates you and puts you in bed and doesn't allow you to get out in the morning. 
The thing is, Christians shouldn't have to carry it. And there are Christians who, having confessed their sins and believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, have moved on and they've moved past residual emotions of condemnation for sins past. Now, if you are among those who have moved past guilt because you recognize that Jesus forgave you and you don't have to carry it, then God bless you. Uh, and and uh, pray for your brothers and sisters who are not so fortunate. Because though forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, there are many who live lives beset upon by oppressive feelings of guilt. And I know that we uh, have our theology straight and we know that we're not saved by our works and I know that we know that we're forgiven by Jesus Christ and it's based on the integrity of his shed blood and not our own works or our own accomplishments that we continue in our salvation. But we can still feel beset upon by our guilt. Let's stop and pray about that. Father, I ask you that in the name of Jesus Christ, this morning, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, create many channels of understanding so that each one of us would be able to understand the particular truth you want to speak to our hearts. And we commit this to your grace. With expectation, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about King David. King David is a very interesting person, but frankly, some of the time, he is a royal mess. He's author of most of the Psalms, which are beautiful, but he was a human person with very good days and very bad days. Now, if you have your Bibles handy, please turn to the Psalms. We're going to take a walk through some of them. Now, I don't know if <clears throat> you are accustomed to Speaking out loud, normally that's not a good thing to do in church, especially, uh, you know, talking over the preacher. But I'm going to invite you to say one of two things today, because I want to look at some of David's psalms, and you can say, I'm going to ask you, is it a good day for David, or is it a bad day for David? Because David was a human being, and he had both kinds of days. And he probably had some in-between ones, too. So, Psalm 33. We didn't read from that one. I'm going to read a few verses of that psalm, and then you tell me, is it a good day for David or a bad day? Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Is that a good day or a bad day? Good day, right. Okay, very perceptive. It'll get a little trickier, but uh, that's an obvious good day. Here we go, Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Good day or bad day? It's a good day. It's a good day. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. 27. 27. You could guess what 23 was, I'm sure. Psalm 27. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. Good day or bad day? There's a little mix there. Because he's talking about trouble, but he's in, he's in victory over it this day. So this is a pretty good day. Now let's go to Psalm 51, just by illustration. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Good day or bad? David's feeling the weight of his sin and of his life. And so if we went on, I would, uh, I would point you to Psalm 55 uh, as an example. Let's just read a few verses of that. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stairs of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and the storm. Good day or bad day? Bad day. Depressed day. Almost panic attack kind of day. So. Our having acknowledged David as having a wide range of regular human emotions like we all do. He has, uh, we've seen him with victorious writing and we've seen him with defeated kind of writing. And he has that. Even though he sometimes comes around at the end of the psalm and says, in, in the midst of my defeat, I know God is great. There are still some psalms that are very, very defeatist. So we go back to the text that we started with originally in our public reading. And especially, uh, I want to point out verse 4 of Psalm 38. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. Psalm 38, verse 4. Guilt sucks our joy away. Guilt siphons off the joy that we might otherwise experience in life. And so guilt is a problem even in a Christian church, even among those who are believers. So I don't plan to propose a, uh, uh, a theological catalog of every aspect of truth that the Bible has to say about guilt, but there's a few things that we can observe, both from Scripture and, and from life. Guilt. Many Christians carry it, even though all of us know and affirm intellectually that God has forgiven us through His Son. 
we still at times sense that somehow God has not been entirely able to forgive our sins. Why is that? We have no problem listening to the testimony in a prayer meeting of someone else who talks about God relieving them of their guilt and forgiving them of some long-standing sin. We say, good for them. But our own guilt can still crop up in one little corner or another, or a large corner, and bring us down. Somehow we think that our personal sin is worse than whatever dwells in other people. And somehow we think that our sin rises above God's capacity or willingness to forgive. Now when I composed this sermon, I was preparing to launch into one or more of the beautiful and comforting passages of Scripture, and there are many, where, where uh, the writer is talking about how God relieved him or her of guilt. And there are a lot of those encouraging biblical passages of assurance. But when I was writing this, I felt checked in my spirit, and a new word of encouragement came to my mind, and it found its way uh, onto the paper of my sermon notes. Here is that word of comfort. Are you ready? for the one whose heart makes her or him believe that her or his personal sin has risen beyond the Almighty's sin-cleansing capacity. You're about to feel comforted. Here's the phrase. How arrogant. Do you feel better? How arrogant. Those are the words. When I was ready to write down one of the many passages of uh, assurance, the Holy Spirit in my heart checked me, and I thought, how arrogant. How arrogant it is for you or for me to think that our dirty stain, our dark event, our stark omission supersedes the Savior and his cross. How arrogant for me or you to think that our sins have created a stack of trespasses so high that the blood of Jesus Christ congeals at the sight of them and becomes ineffective. Have we not read Romans 5.20, which instructs us, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Shall we continue to sin so that grace will increase? No way. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. It does not say except in your heart. Except in my heart. It says wherever sin increased, grace increased all the more. In 1 John 3, verses 19 to 20, say, This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts. John is saying the problem of sin causes residual guilt, and we can feel guilty, but God is greater. Because... Whether we feel forgiven is irrelevant because we are forgiven if we have confessed our sins, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ because it is based on the integrity of his word and not how we feel. Whether we are forgiven. And God always keeps his word. John understood that and wrote those words specifically to Christians in a Christian church who sometimes feel unforgiven. So we have the same, some of the same problems with works doctrines before and after Christ saves us. At some point, we come to understand that we can become Christians, we can be forgiven of our sins, 
not based on making ourselves better, but on the grace of Jesus Christ, right? And so we say we're not saved by our works, right? But we have a problem when we get to the other side of salvation sometimes. Because sometimes we begin to feel that it is by our works day to day that we remain saved and that we're kind of earning our salvation as we go. And that is just as false as being able to be saved by our works. So, it is true that there are spots that are dark and dirty at various points in our lives. What we haven't always understood is that the enemy of grace in our own sin nature continues the warfare of condemnation throughout our lives, and the only rescue for this is faith in Jesus Christ, that our sins are forgiven, it's based on his blood, it's based on his integrity, he's done it, he's accomplished it, I'm forgiven, and I can move forward. And I can have the assurance of his forgiveness. And sometimes we slip into the pew with those foolish Galatians, you know. Uh, we like to read uh, how, you know, Paul and others uh, put down different churches sometimes because it makes us feel better, you know. Those foolish Galatians. What was their problem? Paul is saying, having believed that Christ saved you by grace, are you going to continue to believe that you continue your salvation by your works somehow out of God's grace he says God's grace will have will be of no effect for you if you adapt that and adopt that attitude so such reasoning created originally the doctrine of a place called purgatory now we evangelicals don't believe in that we can't find it in the Bible, so we don't uh, believe in it. But purgatory is a place, theoretically, that you go to instead of hell, because you've already missed hell, but you go to a place pre-heaven where your sins are purged, thus the name purgatory. You have to pay for your sins. For a while. That place and that thinking comes from this heaviness that guilt creates, even in the body of Christ, even in good folks like you and me. I have good news. We are not saved by our works, nor is our salvation maintained in Christ by our newfound merits. It is faith and grace from first to last, as Paul teaches us in Romans 1, 17. Now, about the how arrogant thing. It's meant to encourage us. See, it's the arrogancy of our self-centeredness and our works nature that condemns us. Because even though Jesus saved us, we persist in, tr in having just a little bit of belief that we are keeping ourselves safe. And so when we fail, we feel like our failure keeps us somehow from God's grace. And that is a little bit of spiritual arrogance. God knows your heart. Our hearts aren't unique. Our secrets aren't unique. All sin condemns, and your sin is not some special brand uniquely resistant to the grace of Christ, nor is mine. It is not some super bad super bug that cannot be successfully inoculated by the blood of Christ, if I can put it that way. Jesus, grace, saves us from sin, period. 
God's got you covered. And he's got me covered. Past, present, and future. And so on a day when I wake up and I feel guilt, I can say, no, my feelings are irrelevant. I'm being arrogant again because I think my sin is bigger than Jesus. And it isn't. Jesus has us covered past, present, and future. I hope God will bless that particular word and message to our hearts today.